Um, welcome everyone to this week's DDU teaching and today the topic is going to be about VA ECMO and on LV distension um, in particular and we are very very pleased to have Yang Yang who is a associate professor and a rare breed in intensive care medicine being dual trained in cardiology and intensive care which is incredible so we're very thankful that you've joined us and are giving this talk. Um, thanks, Emma, for your kind words. And um, Emma did a fair bit of work for me as well, you know, while we were preparing for the slides and um, as you work in big cardiac centres in the past. So I think that we're just going to be more interactive for this one and um, and hopefully that everyone will get a little bit out of this. Yeah. Both Emma and I are going to um, share you with some of our um, learnings from LV distension on VA ECMO. It is a pretty ad hoc topic, um, so um, I think that it is it's worthwhile discussing, certainly going to be related to our patient care. Um, as you may all aware that um, the LV distension on VA ECMO um, had been had been recognised. Um, it is a bit under-recognised in the past until a very late stage, but these days that I think have been recognised um, much earlier. And um, I think part of that is because of, you know, like we had a recent trial that we completed um, and read from the ECLS shock trial that was published last year and suggested that in the AMI cardiogenic shock group that um, uh, a randomized study looking at doing ECMO or routine care actually brings no difference. And not only that, there is a tendency towards harm of bleeding and other vascular complications in the ECMO arm. I think that raised a lot of discussion that why that result was um, being found in that way. Um, in comparison, that just recently, about a couple of weeks ago, the published danger trial in a similar patient group looking at um, a, a impeller devices um, to standard care in, in the AMI cardiogenic shock group. Um, and actually showing quite substantial amount of improvements of, um, of survivals, as you can see from the graph next. Both published in New England Journal of Medicine, both being very extensive discussed in the mechanical support societies. Um, and the main difference between these two devices that as we all know that um, BA ECMO is a retrograde perfusion arterial cannula. Um, it goes against the native cardiac flow. However, the impeller or similar devices are anti-grade flow um, and um, it's actually reducing the LVDPs and providing um, perfusion support. But however, certainly there are, there are another major difference that the VA ECMO does not does have an ostronator and the impeller does not have an ostronator. So I think the survival difference that have been listed here that made people think um, what actually bring down the, the, the benefits of ECMO um, in this group? And then some theories that was hinted that maybe it is because of the LV distension of the ECMO. So what is actually LV distension? Um, there are two physiologies. As we all know that the, the ECMO pump that is literally um, taking the blood from the venous system and retrograde infused into the arterial systems so it did increase the afterload um, and when the heart is extremely poor and struggle with ejecting, the increased afterload can cause um, the, 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 um, the potential falling RV become more and more um, unwell and raising of the LVEDPs and even potentially dropping off the coronary perfusions and leading to LV distension. That's one possibilities. Um, the other theory about it, it's about the competency of the aortic valve as because it's a retrograde um, flow and pressure to the heart. And if the aortic valve is not competent, then blood can, can easily um, regurgitate into the LV because of poor ejection fractions and causing LV distension. And I think one of the direct result of LV distension is the circulatory volume instead of going to the systematic circulation, they build up in the LV and they accumulate in the lungs and they cause severe APOs and potentially even excess insufficiency on the ECMO pump because not enough blood having flown in back to the ECMO pump, they'll build up in the lungs. So I think that's the two series. Um, as we all know that um, more into this matter, they're looking at the pathophysiology behind of our cardiac physiology. So the black line here, it's a normal heart. Um, and then the red line here have been shifted towards the right, that is a failing heart. So as you can see with the failing heart, the filling pressure is already increased. 
if you add on additional ECMO of the afterload to a falling heart, then this, this graph is literally just shift even more towards to the right. However, that if we do it with the Impala, it sort of bring it back a little bit. And if you're actually doing the Impala and the ECMO together, it sort of bring it more back towards the normal. Um, the, the study about that, um, this pressure volume loops are mostly done outside of the body by simulators. Um, and the coronary physiology have been also studied in animals, uh, but our group are currently studying the coronary physiologists in, in human. Um, I haven't had any report to share yet, but however, that the, the theory behind it's actually not that complicated. Um, for example, as we are aware that our coronary perfusion are driven by the difference of the, um, the aortic root pressure and also the LVEDP. And the left side of the coronary arteries are mainly perfused during diastolic and the right side of coronary arteries are perfused at both diastolic and systolic. And as you can imagine with the backflow of the ECMO cannulas and the pressures that the LVEDP is going to be raised and also the perfusion pressure going to be dropped. Therefore that it hinted that it's most likely going to reduce of the coronary perfusions and leading to more cardiac ischemia and potential even worse outcomes later on. So I think that it, it's certainly this kind of theory is yet to be proved, but however that um, seeing the study coming out of the ECIS shock, um, we believe that it can be potentially linked between the, the, um, the, the outcome that we see to the syndromes, the LV distension that we notice. So what is actually LV distension? Um, LV distension can be defined as a pathological increase of LV and diastolic pressure, LVEDP, or volume, LVEDV, that actually caused or exaggerated by the VA ECMO. Um, there is actually, interestingly, although it has been recognized, but not yet a universally accepted definition of LV distension, um, rather to say it is a progression of a spectrum of symptoms. And a lot of centers that um, probably mostly will accept LV distension when they're going to a moderate to severe categories um, and usually will not really label them as LV distension at the early stage. But if you actually look at the, um, the grade of severity of LV distension as um, published in this paper here in 2022, I think, um, it's, it's mainly it's a, a progress of looking at multiple things, not just the echoes, but also the, you know, the physiology, the arterial pressure, the central venous pressures, echo the wedge pressures by the swan gans, and also the chest x-rays, or even, you know, pulmonary ultrasounds by the B lines. So in the minor situation, when it first started, you may notice that it, the positivity of the arterial pressure actually dropped between 15 to 10, um, and the CVT started to rise to about 8 to 12. Um, the aortic valve may be reduced opening um, instead of opening one to one. It starts to open one to two, or it probably previously was a fully open aortic valve and now it's only half open. Um, and you may have a bit of distension of the LV, a bit of distension of the LA, may have a bit of other echo findings we're going to talk a bit later. And a raise of the wedge pressure indicated by the rates of EDP and pulmonary congestions that as you can see from here. But however, once you go to a more severe degree, um, you will notice that there are significant changes of the hemodynamics where we are actually in the severe degree that the positivity of the arterial pressure are markedly reduced. Um, and then the CVP are markedly raised and the AV is almost not opened. Um, and the wedge pressure was more than 25. And there are a lot of um, in, in tissue edema plus redistribution of those there's additional fluid loading to the pulmonary circulation and sometimes can even cause pulmonary hemorrhage and alveolar arterial rupture. So it's clearly it's a very serious disease um, and it needs to be recognized early to salvage the heart and the lungs. Um, therefore, that um, we do need to know that who are actually at risk. So certainly that if a person have a QAMI with already a falling heart, that they are at risk because of all the styling curve are telling us. Um, if they had advanced cardio cardiomyopathy, that is, it is again also at risk because the heart is poor. Um, if they do have pre-existing LD regurgitations, that they can at risk of um, having, you know, more possible to developing this syndrome. Um, however, it doesn't mean that if a person does not have aortic regurgitation, will have no risk of developing that, um, as we already explained earlier. 
um, a prolonged eCPR cases can cause that as well. Um, and usually you will see clinically that a dilated non-positive LV and also a lot of blood or fluid that coming out from the ETT and excess insufficiencies in the ECMO pumps. Interesting part of that is that the, um, some of those chronic features, um, such as you know um, the chronic heart failure with mitral regurgitation, VSD, ASD, may be actually pre protective of this LV to actually blowing out. But however, that's, there will be similar severe consequence for the lung injuries because the fluids are still accumulated in the lungs. So that's that. The obvious, um, clearly that um, even without being able to do echoes or anything, it's, you will notice that everything became flatlined. Um, and I don't know how many flat lines you can see there. Um, as the heart rate became flatlined since the heart no longer beating, the arterial became flatlined since that there is no longer any positivity. There is only a main perfusion pressure. CVT became flatlined and can't be read. Um, the normal set pro can't be read as everything is a flatline and you really do not have a CO2 there as well. So everything goes flatline basically. Certainly that we don't want to go to that degree of LV distension. Therefore that um, because there is significant con um, consequence of that as the, the intended myocardial injury can potentially hinder of the recoveries. Therefore, that we do need to pick up this, this um, syndrome much earlier and try to treat it as a medical emergency and treat it appropriately, such as medical treatments and venting. Um, therefore, that um, I think ECHO is going to play a very major role in this. And I'm just going to hand over to Emma to talk yeah, about the ECHO's findings. So Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Yang. Um, so absolutely there's a spectrum of LV distension syndrome and as Yang was saying echo can be fundamental in picking this up you know in those early phases. I'm going to keep it fairly simple there's some lovely articles on this um, the one by Jelaine Duflay um, is really about via ECMO not too much focused on LV distension although there are discussions of that and then there's a another paper that focuses more on um, it's sort of an expert consensus paper um, by Azad um, from last year in circulation that's a lovely paper that focuses on LV distension uh, how to recognize it early and some of the things you know that we look at so we'll go through these systematically um, you know in terms of how you might sort of approach this in an exam sort of format um, and just yeah ask questions as we as we go along and I'll certainly be asking Yang for her opinion on some of this as well um, so we'll start with the LV size and wall thickness um, if you could skip through that to me yeah that that's a table just summarizing what we're going to talk through basically um which you can come back to and look at and i'm happy to to share this with you if you would like at the end so lv size um you know we can talk about the differences in tt versus toe but this is what should all be familiar to us um, making those size assessments in the parasternal long axis um if we just play those loops yang we can see that this is a, a, a patient with pretty burnt out end stage sort of dilated cardiomyopathy um, you almost don't need to measure that LVD but you can see that the diameter is close to eight centimeters so big dilated LV um, reduced captation in the, of the mitral valve is going to be MR there and we can see there's thin walls so this is classic of a you know dilated cardiomyopathy patient um, so we should of course, measure the sizes, measure the the volumes, and you know these patients are, of course, because of that pressure volume loops that we just saw there, and the where they are on that starling curve, they're going to be at high risk of LV distension syndrome. So you're going to have your spidey sense heightened before you even put them on, um, and. Really, you know, everything in ECHO, isn't it? It's about trends and just paying attention to the details. So the LV geometry is obviously important with law of Laplace and things like that. So those big, thin um, ventricles are going to have a higher um, LV wall tension. And so once we put that retrograde flow back through, it's going to increase further. And then what we start to see is the LV blown out, the LV distension syndrome developing. So looking at serial changes in your LV um, dimensions is a is a good thing to do. Um, as Yang and I were talking earlier, and we'll show show this on the next case, I think, is that you know we don't often see that um, nice slow increment in LV size. It's it's often goes from zero to to you know being completely blown out. 
apologies for that. Um, and I think this is shown nicely. And these these are Yang's. Um, this is Yang's patient. This is the same patient, um, pre ECMO and post ECMO. I don't think there was too much time in between. You can see in that first loop. Is that is that playing all right for everyone? It's a little bit slow on my end. Um, anyway. It doesn't change things too much. We've got a small LV cavity, as you can see, with impaired biventricular um, function pre ECMO. Um, and this is a TT picture. And we can see the mid esophageal view at zero degrees. We've got this hugely blown out LV. It's completely stretched the mitral annulus. So you've got a wide open uh, mitral apparatus with free flowing MR. Um, which we'll show on another slide. And you can see, what does anyone else notice um, on on the loop there as well? That's in the left atrium. Anything that you can... Yeah, nice. So that's, again, I mean, you, it just adds to the picture, doesn't it? That, um, you know, this is terrible LV distension syndrome. We're starting to get thrombus formation. And you know that when you start to see that, that's sort of a pre preterminal event. You need to act pretty quickly um, before, it's, before it's game over, really. Um, so, yeah, important to look at size, thickness for risk prediction and also to then um, trend that and allow you to to act quickly. Um, moving on to systolic function of the LV, um, we know that. So I must say that, you know, for all of this, there are, there's no great, you know, robust evidence in terms of hard and fast cutoff values. Um, and some of this is extrapolated from, you know, the weaning studies, you know, factors, um, par parameters predicting successful weaning or not. Um, but generally speaking, you know, if we have patients with lower ejection fractions and, you know, definitely lower than 10 percent, um, you know, those getting around lower than 20 percent are going to be the ones that you that are going on to ECMO anyway. Um, but these patients are obviously at higher risk of, of developing it. And um, yeah, measures of, of ejection fraction, whether that's eyeball or the usual techniques um, are useful to help risk stratify. Um, we can use obviously sometimes our images, especially with TT, are not too good. So this where tissue Doppler, I think, is, is really helpful. Um, you often don't need, you know, two like, good views for this and you still get reasonable um, tissue Doppler. And so we can look at the S prime. Um, which on this patient here who is on VA um, is around about four or five. Um, you can see the S prime value at the top. That yellow dot that you can see there is meant to be at the peak of there um, at around five. And so less than six. Again, you know, this is telling you that you've got reduced systolic function. Maybe, maybe this makes this, these patients higher risk. But you never hang your hat on one value. And then, of course, looking at LVOT, VTI as a surrogate for stroke volume. Um, and we know that if that's less than 10, again, these are the highest risk patients um, for developing, you know, LV distension. And we talk a lot about, I guess, you know, in non-ECMO patients as well about LVOT, VTI recruitability. You know, when we're starting inotropes or we're giving fluid, whatever it might be. Um, and again, often looking at the trend in your VTI as you're going up and down on flows can give you an idea of how much that myocardium is struggling. So if it's not recruiting stroke volume when you're reducing flows, then that's again one of those sort of canary in the coal mines um, that this patient's very high risk of, of developing um, distension syndrome. Do you have anything else to, to say about that that in particular, um, Yang? Yeah, and um, I I wish to say that although LVOT VTI is very widely used, it's actually not much um, you know evidence around it. Um, it. But it is easy to get. It is sort of widely used, and it's sort of widely accepted. Less than ten, everybody gets a bit worried. Um, and we usually say that a recruitable ventricle is like. You know, when you actually go down with the flow, either it's an impeller weaning or it's an ECMO weaning that you can just, or VAT weaning, you know, like more than 10% of increase. Um, but however, that um, this is, again, a single parameter, so we probably need to look at multiple parameters about weanings. Um, so we just need to be cautious when we are actually using VTR a lot, and um, it is a common thing to do, but however, it's probably not the entire picture. Thank you. Um, so TT versus toe is, is no different in any, you know, in any normal patient. The, the, you know, we're obviously going to have limited views sometimes, aren't we? Especially in the cardiac patients, they might have other various things going on. They're sick. They're in the ICU. They're positioning. So often the pictures are not great. Whereas with toe, we can obviously get better views. 
TT though allows you, it's non-invasive, it's easy, portable, we can get serial assessment, which is one of the main benefits of it. Um, it's a bit harder, isn't it? Especially with with toe getting serial assessment. So, um, you know, it's a bit limited from, from that perspective. You can, of course, but it's not easy and certainly not without risk, especially in these patients that are often anticoagulated and and those kind of things. Um, I guess the big thing that's going for it with TTE is that you can get better Doppler angles, which is obviously important if we're going to be trending things LV or TVTI um, and try to have that as accurate as possible. So there are, um, I think I would see the, the, them being complementary as opposed to one versus the other. Um, and certainly using both could, would probably um, be most helpful. So the difficulty of estimating filling pressures in, in these patients, um, of course, it's not, not going to be with echo, as Yang mentioned at the beginning there. It's this whole picture, isn't it, of invasive hemodynamics, of looking at the lungs, of looking you know, at their biochemistry and how they are clinically and things like that. Um, but there are certain things that we can look at. And again, no robust evidence, but it kind of has a lot of good physiological rationale. Um, and again, it's the, the trend and the changes in these numbers. So, you know, E to A values of more than two, especially if that's combined with that short D cell times, so that restrictive LV filling pattern would be suggestive that you're dealing, you know, with a patient pre, pre going on that, that they've got high LOPs and E to E prime of more than 15. Um, again, suggestive of high filling pressures. Of course, we have those grey zones, so less than eight, you know, it's unlikely um, combined with other things that you've got high filling pressures. Um, and then that grey zone between eight and 15, who knows? So you need to look at other things as well. And I think good, th you know, useful things to look at and certainly very pragmatic is the position of the intraatrial septum. So you can see in this bottom frame here, that's bowing to the right. Um, again, just, you know, suggest that highly suggestive. You've got rip roaring, raised left atrial pressures and lots of B lines in the lung there. So putting all of that together in a patient, you know, with an LV systolic function like that, this patient's got very high, um, you know, filling pressures and they're going to struggle a lot and the lungs are going to become congested um, once you start increasing up that retrograde flow. Um, the left atrium, the size and, you know, if it's elevated, if it's dilated, there's likely to be an element of chronicity there. But remember, especially in our sick cohort, you know, often our patients that have high pressures often have normal left atrial sizes. And that's because the, the compliance and things and the function of the LA is changing acutely. Um, so just because there's a small LA doesn't mean to say you, you're not dealing with um, raised filling pressures. It's important to bear in mind. So this is showing again that same patient who is on flows of two, um, showing reduced lateral and medial E prime velocities and maybe take that E to A with a bit of a pinch of salt. I'm not sure I'm convinced that's an A wave there, but anyway, we've got a really tall E wave with a short D cell time, um, uh, you know, combined with everything else that you can see suggesting this patient has congestion and raised filling pressures. Um, and the E to E prime on this patient was 22. It's interesting the study by um, the study by Nadia Asiao in JACE in 2012, in that the E to E prime and E wave velocities and you know the surrogates of filling pressures didn't differentiate those who were weaned successfully and and not. Um, and again, I think this is an area for more you know for more research along with some of the things that Yang's, Yang's mentioned, especially in the LV distension realm. And then, of course, you know, looking at the LV, the aortic valve and the mitral valves are inextricably linked to the LV. Um, and a, an assessment of the LV wouldn't be complete without looking at the, the valves. So um, aortic valve opening, clearly important, as Yang's already mentioned. I think if you're losing that, that's a very bad sign. That's a pre-terminal sign. Um, and we'll show you a picture of that. Aortic regurgitation, of course, if that's getting worse and your LV is not able to eject that, you've got more backwards flow than you have forward flow. Um, and the, that patient's a sitting duck for, for thrombus formation and, you know, ultimately death um, if that's if that's not addressed. Um, again, mitral regurgitation, as Zhang was saying, in the chronic patients, it often acts as this pop-off valve, doesn't it, just to offload the LV. 
but the trade-off to that is that your lungs get wet and um, all this the subsequent sequelae from that um, so a little bit of balance with the with the mitral regurg important to look at the um, the mechanism of course of the AR and MR because if you've got someone in ECMO and they've got a primary cause for their valve lesions you know big vegetation or dissection you know whatever that might uh, you know pap muscle rupture whatever that might be then that's obviously going to need fixing um, so important to to look for the for the etiology of the of the valvular regurgitations um, and then systolic AR it just sounds terrible saying that. Obviously, this is a very, very bad sign. Um, the pressures in the aortic root are higher than that in the LV during systole. I mean, that just sounds incompatible. There's some, Yang's got a lovely um, slide showing that. And then diastolic MR um, is what we see if we have raised filling pressures. So that could be, you know, um, included in in your sort of filling pressure assessment as well if you're seeing diastolic mitral regurg so quite a lot to look for in the valves as well as the lv so these are loops showing normal aortic valve opening without any aortic regurg we are in the three chamber view on a transesophageal echo um, just seeing normal what normal looks like essentially in terms of the opening nice thin pliable leaflets without any significant regurge and then we have a loop showing or oh, this is with TTE at the level of the aortic valve and we can see that that aortic valve in 2D is kind of fixed isn't it it's not it doesn't look like it's opening at all um, and if we just, I think the M mode is really useful here. And obviously those that do VAD weaning studies will be more used to looking at this because you can measure how long it's opening for. Um, you can see here, you've just got this sort of, it could almost join that screen that Yang just showed with all the flat lines. The M mode for the aortic valve also becomes um, a flat line as well. So, and I find the M mode quite useful just to, um, you know, gives you a pretty picture if nothing else. But um, I think it is useful in terms of when they're doing more um, more weaning for VADs. Would, do you use that much, uh, Yang, the sort of measuring out the timing and stuff? With the... Yeah, especially for timing, because we do wish for, especially for explantation, we do wish for the AO valve can be maintained open for 200 milliseconds. Um, that's for weaning to explantation of that. But however, that to actually seeing that whether a person is okay to be weaned, or, or if we try to load the heart and wing them off, you know, like um, we do want them on um, the aortic opening to be more than 200 milliseconds. But however, if um, I'm got, I got someone is waiting for a transplant or something, and in that case that I want to fully unload the ventricle, I don't want the aortic valve to be opening that much. I actually want to aim for the aortic valve opening to be less than 200 milliseconds. That means that I'm actually fully unloaded the left ventricle from LVAD perspective. So it depends on what sort of indications that um, we're using that aortic valve opening time for. Um, but however, that um, it is a quite a useful marker. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions so far? Any questions for Yang on things that we've seen, seen so far? Come back to that. Um, Rishi, what's this showing? So saying at the top. Yeah, worst thing out to get. What was the what was the context of this Yang, this patient again? Oh, it's a it's a failure to wean after ABR and then um, end up with a, a central bypass be converted to a peripheral bypass. Um, and and you can see from there there is a very big jet of perivalvular leak. It almost goes horizontal down. Yeah, so. I was going to say, yeah, the, the plane of it yeah. as well. Yeah, very nasty. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously bad to see if you're seeing worsening AR from, I mean, from an LV distension syndrome perspective, that's obviously, a, again, a, a, a massive risk factor that you're going to be running into trouble fairly soon. Um, yeah, we end up with venting this person because it's just the regurgitation volume is just way too big, you know, like it's hard for the car to cope. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm always amazed at how sick the hearts are that you that you deal with, uh, Yang. All right, I'm remind also me where Yang... how they are able to be alive. <laughs> like, look at this one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I've not seen this before. This is a quite. I don't. I don't know. Do you see this often? 
Uh, no, this is fairly terminal, I have to say. Um, yeah. This is almost like the heart is not ejecting at all, aortic valve is fully closed and there is continuous jet because the root pressure difference. Oh, you see that? Okay. Systolic, oh, systolic uh, with, with no aortic valve open. I mean, just, just yeah, crazy. Did this patient survive? Uh, I can't remember. Um, I, I would doubt that 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 is the case. Um, but yeah, there are many cases, so I can't remember exactly the outcome of this particular person. Jamba looks very deep. Yeah. Um, we talked a bit about, you know, mitral regurgitation. Um, and obviously, if this is severe, you're going to flood the lungs and, you know, increase congestion, pulmonary edema and all of that. Um, and, yeah, important. You can see a trace of MR in this, um, you know, sort of two chamber, more or less, in a transesophageal echo. Um, so you wouldn't worry too much about that. But then severe, severe MR on that TTE. This one is the you know, the LV, acute LV distension that we saw in that first loop with that mitral valve, it almost looks like, you know, one, like a carcinoid valve, doesn't it? Like just completely stuck open because um, it's just been stretched so much by the annulus. And and this is a beautiful demonstration, I think, of that, how it's really, you know, there's that lamina flow, um, you know, when it's free flowing, it's just lamina and um, how you could easily miss, you know, usually we talk about how you can easily miss severe pulmonary regurgitation in like the post tough repairs or something, you know, when it just looks like this and you don't realise that it's a severe wide open um, PR, I guess, you know, the same for tricuspid regurg and things as well. And it's often when you put Doppler through and you see that V, v cut off sign um, because of that huge giant V wave in the atria that that it, um, you know, you, obviously the 2D appearance would help you out there as well. But um, yeah, just horrendous free flowing MR. Yikes, this is a scary one, isn't it? So SEC, um, spontaneous echo contrast, sometimes gets called smoke. Um, this is a precursor for thrombus formation and obviously, you know, need to therefore act quickly to offload the LV, whether that be with non-invasive or invasive things fairly quickly. Um, and then if there's established thrombus like there is in this loop in the aortic root as well as the LV, this is a pretty, you know, again, pre-terminal sign and um, an urgent offloading and, and what have you is is obviously needed there. How often would you say you see this, um, Yang, in, in LV distension syndrome to getting to this point and being able to salvage them? Yeah, it's, um, when it gets this far, it's it's almost impossible to salvage because even if you salvage them, that it's very hard to remove the clot um, without a stroke, um, and the outcomes are usually fairly poor. So I think we do need to get get to early before we actually get this far. Um, but having smoking the in any part of the heart is actually fairly common to see in ECMO, you know, um, patients and. Um, and I can sometimes even see lamina type of sm smoke just in the arch and, um, you know, or the aortic root. And um, it's actually fairly common to see, especially when, you know, like um, these days that most of the patient will have toe and much better images. Um, and it's it's actually not that rare to see, you know, like smokes or things or stasis that inside the, inside the heart or in the major arteries. I might leave this one to you, Yang. Yeah, this is a little bit of work that we have been sort of doing. And um, I mean, that it's it's a new technology on the GE machines called blood flow speckle tracking. Um, it's usually using pediatric populations to look at congenital heart diseases. But we start to apply that in, um, in our ECMO um, patients um, and trying to explain that, you know, why um, LV distension sometimes can be seen even with a competent aortic valve, like we, we haven't really seen any sort of aortic regurgitation there on the routine color Dopplers. And then what we find interestingly that if you look closer just to the cell valvular structure just in the LVOT, that there is a black line that separate the blood flow between the ejection part of going to the aorta or the other part actually returning to the LV. And we sort of call that a butterfly sign because it looked like a butterfly. Um, however, that um, th this is actually probably a 
mechanics that we can explain why people, some of them actually have LV distension, although they, they do have a competent aortic valve, um, because the because the regurgitant is actually happening at the cell valvular level and could not be detected by the usual color dopplers. But you can see that quite clearly on this um, color special um, speckle tracking on the VA ECMOs that 50% um, of the blood end up not actually going to the LVOT into the aorta rather than retain inside the, the ventricles. Um, and we actually have a poster publication of that in the ELSO conference. Um, however, that um, with more cases, we're probably looking forward to write it up as a paper. Um, any questions on that? So you can see the black line here and forward flow, backward flow. Um, usually that in, in the common circumstance that all the flow will go this way. It's a laminar flow, not this chaotic. Okay, the RV paradox, please, Emma. Yeah. I've made that up actually, that term, but it does seem like that to me because obviously um, you want the RV to be reasonably okay, but you don't want it to be too good. Um, so if you can imagine, if your ECMO cannulas are not draining all of the, um, you know, the blood that's in the RV and your RV is pumping away, then you're going to essentially flood and overload that struggling LV um, with more uh, pulmonary venous return, which is going to go to your LV. So paradoxically, you know, having too a vigorous an RV contractility, especially if your drainage cannulas um, are not, you know, fully offloading that RV, then you can potentially make things things worse by having your LV RV too good, which is why I just put here the Goldilocks principle. So you want the RV to be just right, um, and I think this is where some of that that nuance that I was talking about at the beginning really comes in, um, and. Yeah, interested in how you how you deal with this, uh, Yang, from a, a you know everyday perspective. If you're if you're trying to to reduce LV distension without necessarily um, you know venting. Yeah, I don't know. Look, to be honest, that um, each person is slightly differ, and it's it's very hard to actually sort of go down to like a a, a one way cut off. Yes, we're going to down the ECMO flow up, fully drain the RV, and therefore they will have less LV distension. Or we're just going to down the flow down and and let the RV pump a little bit, and hopefully with reducing of after low of this, you know, less ECMO flow against the heart, the distension can get a bit better. I mean, um. It, it really depends on what kind of configuration it is. I find that in a central configuration that is a higher chance of successful fully draining the RV in the peripheral situation that is always a bit tricky to fully drain the RV without being assessed insufficiency. Um, and then um, the other thing is the blood go back to the ventricles, even if you fully drain the RV and you, still, you may still end up with an LV distension there. Um, I, I really don't have a good solution, you know, like um, to, to prevent that um, without venting by purely dialing up and down of the, of the flows. Yeah, very hard. All right, so we may we may now talk into the treatments about um, the LV unloading as a medical emergency. Thank you, Emma, for taking us through of all the um, echo pictures and uh, and the major signs that we're looking for at different stages of the LV distension. Um, certainly, that the treatment for LV unloading or LV distension um, it's actually a medical emergency, as we know that um, if we do have a non positive ECMO and a very worsening pulmonary edema, we quickly do the echo, we search for all the signs we've been talking about. And if LV distension is the cause of all of these findings, um, we find that there are stasis, the LV is neither distended or not distended, but however, looking very unwell, um, there is no LV valve opening or reduced opening, then we'll try to reduce the ECMO flow, reduce the volume and reduce the MAP and adding a bit of inotropes or even a balloon pump with unclear um, efficacy and see whether there is any improvements. And all of this almost need to be done within an hour. And if there is no improvements, that, um, then, then we'll go for direct venting, which is neither LA, LA septotomy, that, you know, to let the LA pop to protect the lungs, or the direct drainage, um, surgical drainage, or other percutaneous drainage, and then the impeller, which is active drainage, um, and that will configure the whole system into an impeller system. Um, do people have any questions about that before I move on to the next slide? Okay. 
Can so I, how can we can join? I, oh, sorry, Yang. Can I ask people that work in ECMO centres whether you have a, a protocol like this and whether whether it's something, you know, that systematically is assessed for like this or if it's a little bit vibey and ad hoc? I don't know. I feel like I feel like perhaps it's this is a newish thing that's coming through that sort of taking this stepwise approach is lovely. Um, anyone got experience in doing that? You don't have to say. Fair enough, we're being quiet. That's all right. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, I think that to this to this anotropes, IBP, EPIP, you know, get the map down and all of this. I think that it's it's sort of quite automatic now um, in with the awareness of that because it's still relatively non-invasive. That's the things we can do. But once we actually need to move on to these three things, you know, need a septotomy or direct drainage, surgical venting, or the impellers, then it, it usually involve a, a multidisciplinary or the short team discussion to reach that. And imagine that if we are talking about need to reassess in every hour and such an emergency that um, I think you're, you're very right that, you know, like um, in any centers that, um, you know, like it, it almost require a, a real time MDT discussions to um, to potential facilitate all of this to be happened. So venting, we have multiple ways of venting the heart. Um, if we do decide to go on venting, um, just now is the three most common way of venting. Um, certainly there are some indirect ways such as, you know, septotomy that, you know, blood will be protected the LA coming through the LV and then going to LA and come back to the eye and then back to the, um, the cannulas that go back to the ECMOs. Um, there are some sort of indirect venting through the PA as well to protect the lungs so that it doesn't flood the lung. Um, there are direct venting of the left-hand side that including direct venting of the LA. Um, which will be surgical technique to vend that. Direct surgical event LV, usually it's a transmitral sort of approach, and direct um, LV venting through impeller devices or other sort of trans aortic catheters, which is through the aorta. So you can vend the LV through natural holes, which is the aortas, the mitral valves. You can vend the LA through, you know, like um, a pulmonary vein or other septal punctures. Um, you can certainly vend the LV directly from the apex as well. And then some of other indirect venting on the right hand side, that including venting the PA or venting the RA or venting the RV. Um, the IABP itself um, had very limited role, um, although it's still very easy to use and very widely used of um, IABP to try to vent the ventricles, but the efficacy of the IABP is actually very questionable. So just going to move on to a case study that a young person coming to us with a delayed presentation of AMI or code blue on day four on the wall and rushed to the cath lab. As you can see, we're doing mechanical CPI at the moment. A um, couple of PEAs on the table, and this is an angiogram of his initial infarct. Doesn't look like they have any issues. Um, and then the toe was done at the time that you can barely see the heart. It looks empty. The RV looks empty. And there is looks like there is a pericardial effusion there. So by that time, we're already suspicious of this is a case of a free wall rupture. Anyone have questions on those pictures? So we move on to the eCPR. We put the person on eCPR, um, which is a successful. Um, however, after we initiated the ECMO, that immediately that we almost lost all the positivities and everything became flatlined. We maximized the, um, the medical therapies for LV distension and turned the PEEP up to 20. Um, we also drain the pericardial effusion as well, as we see that there is a pericardial effusion, and we think that by doing that, hopefully we can get the LV pumping a bit better. It is very difficult to drain because it is blood, and there are multiple drain has been here, as you can see. Um, but however, they are all in the pericardium. They're just not draining very well, since that it's mainly blood clot. So after we've done that, there are some success and the positivity return, and they all develop sort of opening a bit more than usual, which is at the moment one to two. So we sort of reaching a bit of stabilities, but certainly things are not still great. As you can see, a lot of stasis that LV is still not pumping very well. Um, we're just about to move to CT and then off flat line again. So we just 
literally flatline CPR, put on ECMO, got a bit of positivity, and then flatlined, and then we drained the um, effusion, plus put on some medical therapy for LV distensions, and we got a bit of positivity back, and then we are all flatlined again. So this is the third time or the fourth time flatlined, um, and the toe was clearly showing that they, now we actually identify where the perforation is. It's sort of in the inferior lateral wall where the infart is. Um, and then um, as time went on, it just became bigger and bigger, and then form a huge clot here um, and that LV is very poor, um, yeah. it's edematous, mm -hmm. it's sick, it's really nothing going through and I was running a lot of SS insufficiency as well at that time, the ECMO can only go up to two litres, I can't go out anymore, um, so we have to actually crash to OR um, in that sort of situation to treat the LV perforation. So this is in theatre that um, we found the rupture um, we put a patch on, it bled and bled, and the patch just couldn't stay on because of the LV distension and the flow inside the LV was just the pressure is too high. It's acute infarct, post-infarct um, rupture. Um, the myocardiums are extremely fragile. Um, it is very hard to sold on anything or even glue on anything um, with the amount of blood coming out from that rupture. Um, so therefore, that in the end, we have to settle the system with a central vent as you can see here, this is from the from the pulmonary vein into the LA, trans the mitral valve into the LV. It is penetrated, as you can see from here, it's sitting at the apex and it's draining both of the LA and the LV. Since we did that, we actually got some stabilities and managed to get the person off the table. Um, on VA ECMO about three liters and the vents are about draining about 260 mils per hour. So we babysit with this person for almost four days, um, actually surprisingly extremely stable. Um, we watched the patch and, and where the, you know, the patch and the myocardium and the leak is. We watched that very carefully to make sure that patch doesn't got blow off. It was almost like a, a very vigilant measurements of the, you know, the LV filling pressure. So therefore that we don't blow off that patch. Um, and secondary that, as you can see here, a complicated configuration of ECMOs, that this is the arterial cannulis with the backflow cannula to the SF base for the legs. This is our usual venous SS that's sitting in the SVC, the RA and the IVCs. And this additional cannula here, which is looking the same color as the arterial cannulis, is the LV vent that we're talking about. So what happened is blood are taken from both of the systematic circulation, which is the LV vent um, from the LV and the LA, and also in the in the RV and RA and the IVCs, they all return to the ECMO pump and go back to the to the um, the the returning arterial cannulas that are actually sitting in the in the femoral artery and back to the heart. So therefore, we can actually very closely monitor the pressures inside here and make sure this pressure is nice and low, so that we don't blow off the patch and allow the time for the heart to heal and the patch to stay on. It is not easy, I have to say. And then it comes to the decan day, which about day four or five, and um, the person is clearly that much better. Um, he had the person had actually went to theater and um, come off the vent initially, um, and then we gradually loading the heart by dialing down the ECMO flows. Um, we hope the patch can stay during that whole period, and that, lucky enough, yes, the patch did stay, and it's actually the heart recovered quite well by that time, as you can see without um, the vent, but however, with the full ECMO flow, without loading the heart, it's sort of underfilled and it's got a VTR about five. However, once we fully load the heart off the, vent, off the ECMO, it's actually got a VTR of 16 and also a lot of myocardial recovery there as well. So in the end, it is a very successful story to come off the vent, not only, and also the ECMOs and patch stay on. So the take home message, um, I think that after all these discussions is, um, Probably more evidence towards to use impaler for AMI cardiogenic shock in the current era. Um, if ECMO has to be used or because of other reasons, then um, we really need to watch for LV distension as one of those disaster things can happen to those patients. And if we are going to vent, then we do need to vent early because it's probably no point of venting too late when the heart is ruptured. Um, so this is my email if you have any questions and I'm probably going to stop the share and then head back to Emma for further discussions. Wow, what a case. My goodness. Um, yeah, and this patient survived to 
to hospital discharge, did they, Yang? I can't remember the details again, that, um, but I think that so far survived. So that's all I can say. Yeah. Wow, incredible. Um, how do you think, I, I have a question if that's all right. Because yeah. obviously the, the, um, the well, what's it called, the, the, the Danish and German study, danger study for Impella is obviously hot off the press. Um, we haven't yes. discussed it yet in our journal club, but what oh, were your, yeah. yeah, what, what, how do you think that that will change the sort of landscape of, of how we, you know, are managing these AMI cardiogenic shock subtypes, um, and yeah, how how do you how quickly do you think that's going to happen? Obviously, we we don't have access to impellers in our hospital. Do you think it'll be? Um, do you think the data from that study will be? practice changing like some of the earlier you know early revascularization studies yeah, back in... trial, yeah 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 look it's hard to tell the future um we have been doing pilot for about five years now and we do have seen pretty good outcomes compared to our echo outcomes in similar groups um we're suspicious at the time that when the danger hasn't been published because it is a bit nerving for all of us that you know like practice in this field that are we actually doing the right thing are we causing harm and i think lots of us actually didn't sleep that night at two o'clock waiting for the american society of cardiology that um actually actually um presented the, the final result of the danger and spontaneously published in New England and then we didn't sleep the rest of the night because of neither being too excited that is one group and then being too disappointed that's the other group so I I think it's probably still early days to say that whether this trial just by itself is going to change practice but it is exciting to see that after so many years of trying of different kind of devices and the falling of ECMOs, the IBPs, and various of things in this group. And finally, we see a little bit of light in the end of the tunnel that maybe the impala is the answer for that group. Um, but I just, at this stage, I can't be confidently based on a single trial to say that um that that th this is going to be the game changer um clearly there are a lot of criticisms that are already coming up regards of the trial as well and they're not going to be blind to that that there are significant amount of um renal failures there are limb ischemia there are other complications that are concerning um however the the mortality benefit actually even overcome those complications i think that is one of the things we do look at. Our local data are actually being analyzed right now and I really don't have too much to say, but um, the there are difference in protocols slightly about how we manage this patient about weaning towards to the danger trial and um, our weaning had been published in the, um, already last year um, in the in the um, I think the local journal in Australia of the Cardia Societies. Um, so our weaning is a bit more quick than the danger. The danger weaning is like they don't wean until 48 hours. Our weaning start as soon as the patient is actually favored. In that case, we are seeing much less complications such as hemolysis and renal replacement therapies or infections or any of that. And because they take off the support earlier, because they got weaned earlier and there are less sort of lean complications as well. So I'm not really sure that whether it's a direct compared to danger to us, our local studies, to um, ECMO. I think that it is a very complex group. Um, you know, like every devices will have a place to use, but just where are we going to use them? In the future, I think very likely for the shock group, especially AMI shock group, left-sided dominant, then it's probably more going to move into the impeller space. Um, however, with CPR, eCPR, and right-sided failure, such as PEs, ECMO is probably the best mechanical support today. By saying that we may even have combinations coming up in the future, such as ECPELA, um, which just adds another sort of, you know, um, difficulties and complexities of managing those people. Um, and certainly more devices you put in, more complications that, you know, finding the, the right cut in between is hard. Um, and certainly everyone had a different desire about their functional outcomes as well. And I think that we do need to think about that as a long-term outcome, which at this stage will mainly focus on mortality. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, um, and it was really sobering to see as well, you know, how static 
the mortality from cardiogenic shock has been looking at the trials 10, 20 years ago compared to now, the mortality rate is still in the high 40s, which I think it was in the, the danger trial as well, wasn't it? In, you know, obviously it's slightly different in the two groups, but still really high. And I wonder what what other things, obviously we're talking about the pointier end of, of cardiogenic shock management. Um, you touched upon how uh, how much of a heterogeneous group this is, you know, whether they're biventricular, right side dominant, left side dominant, like there's all of these factors that come together to, you know, give each individual a different risk profile um, and how we might address some of those earlier, you know, some of those earlier things. Because I, I don't know about you guys in the group, but I find that we often get these patients into the ICU when the horse is already bolted, you know, they're already in that sort of stage C plus D sort of phase of, of the sky classification. It's really hard to then pull them back. And I just wonder, um, yeah, if you've got any thoughts, Yang, on how we can, from a sort of logistical systems perspective, um, try to Im improve some of that in, especially in the hospitals that, you know, haven't got advanced mechanical support. Mm, I think that Look, to be honest, that um, you are probably not going to start advanced mechanical support when someone is in the sky B or C, that you're probably going to trial your medical therapy and, you know, like um, destination therapy, such as if they got a block artery or something like that to be unblocked. Um, however, that it doesn't mean that, you know, like um, there is no need for mechanical therapies um, for those patients because, as we all know, and, you know, like we are all working, you know, intensivist or working in other departments that um, the, the the speed of cardiogenic shock can be literally spiraled down within, you know, minutes and you can have a very stable patient and you suddenly just have a rest patient in front of you and it's not like, you know, something we can we can potentially predict and we just have to deal with it. But I don't think I do think that from a system point of view that um that if if there is a shock team structure, you know, like um so that it can it can actually help with multidisciplinary, especially cardiology, cardiac surgery and ICU with other relevant, you know, units to be able to be alert about those patients, you know, even at their early stages. So and then have a figure out of the plan, you know about if things are going worse, then what are we going to do? And when things are going worse, then you've got your, you know, consensus like almost at the real time. Um, because as the mechanical device is getting more and more complicated and choices become more, then um, which one are we going to use? What time are we going to use? Who is going to put it in? Who is going to look after it? When is going to take out? They're all very complicated questions and may not be able to be solved by one one department or one, you know, like angle. And I will, yes. I'll be highly suggested that as many studies have improved at a short team approach, that you probably will have a, a better patient outcome. Yeah, thank you. How many of you have shock teams in your hospital? Because we don't, um, I'm not sure many centres in New South Wales, you know, have have shock teams in that sort of hub and spoke model that's been shown to be successful in you know, various different places with the studies you were alluding to there. Do you have shock teams in your hospital, Yang, and, and in Melbourne in particular? Like, is there like a yeah, fair few have, hospitals do have that network? Yeah, we only have two hospitals have shock team. One is the Alfred and the other one is Western Central End, and it's actually under the state vet network um, for impalers, and that's why we got the shock team. Um, so... It is, as you said, that it is a growing field and many hospitals are interested in building a short team. But however, that is actually not very easy because there are, you know, yes. lots of love required in between departments. And also every hospital is slightly deeper of what they offer and what they do and what's the choices. Um, so, yeah, at the moment at Curran, there are only two hospitals in Melbourne had short team. But I, I have been travel around to other hospitals, been asked for, you know, helping them build up their own shop teams. And, you know, um, and I, I, I think the interest is definitely there, like of the entire Australia, like up from Queensland North to West to Perth, you know, like there are there are a lot of goodwills there that are trying to build up a, a shop team and a collegial sort of approach for the best outcome for these patients. Yeah. And then I guess the question of how the jog, you know, this, the unique geography of Australia sort of compares to sites like Michigan and all of that. Um, yeah. 
That's interesting. I'd love to chat to you more more about it. I know that we've we've had a New South Wales Cardiogenic Shock Forum and there's about to be another one organised, I think, sort of talking through some of these things. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Does anyone have any questions? Just a, yeah. One question, Yang. Uh, thank you for the talk. I'm Rishi, one of the ECMO fellows at uh, NIPIAN. Uh, just with regards to the weaning from the ECMO, uh, is there any other parameters you use apart from the VTIs, which have been like strain patterns, which have been more predictive towards um, weaning success uh, later on down the track? Yeah, for the weaning, um, I, I think it's a very complicated question because because it depends on the etiology of why they they are shocked in the initial place or why are they arrested. If the primary physiology was not solved, then um, it's almost impossible to win. It doesn't really matter what parameters you're getting. That even if if you get a reasonable parameter, you come off and the problem is still there, and then they will not last. So you can come off, but they will still die later. So I think that yeah. it's it's sort of difficult. And the other thing I think that that using complicated methods such as strains and others that depending a lot on the personnel doing it, the angles and also the picture qualities. And it's hard to sometimes hard to compare, you know, um, when um, in the in the same patient in different time frame, but doing by different people. So we tend to we do have, you know, multiple criteria looking at winning of neither echoes or impellers, but they usually it's a combination of First of all, they need to be stable enough and then their primary problem need to be solved. Or are they actually bridging to vital transplantation, which is the problem problem could not be solved, which when it will not even be attempted. And then um, and then it will be a hematological, or sorry, it will be a hemodynamic type of data with, you know, like the swan scans or other advanced hemodynamic um, monitoring devices. And um, and the echo data, and then um, and then the multidisciplinary discussion, and afterwards mm -hmm. that see what happens. I hope for the best. Yeah, um, yeah. So we, that's probably the, the routine every day thing that what yeah. we do. Yeah. And is that a, a trend towards bridging towards impella where they can be extubated, more be more mobile, and allow them a prolonged period of time to allow the myocardial recovery? Uh, the the impeller inserted through the groin will be quite hard to mm. mobile, but usually they're not intubated because they've got dry lungs. Yeah. Um, the impeller through the axillary route, um, especially surgical implanted, can be mobile and can stay in slightly longer and also had a higher flow rate at 5.5 rather than 4.3. Um, yes. So yes, the I think in New South Wales that currently so Vincent is doing a fair bit of 5.5 five at the moment. It's yeah, still very yeah. relatively new um, to the Australia, but it had been used a lot in Europe and the United States. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anne. And thank you so much.